Good afternoon and welcome to the latest IWFM Navigating Turbulent Times webinar series entitled New Year, New Job, Recruitment Top Tips and Guidance, uh, a topic really relevant as we're in the week of Blue Monday and we continue to be in lockdown. The panel today is uh, Sophie Wayne and Rupa will cover off their tips for landing a new job in 2021 in the context of COVID. Our webinar today covers four topic areas. We've got the recruiter perspective, what is a hiring manager looking for today, the importance of an impactful social profile and portfolio careers. So without further ado, I'll hand over to the panel to introduce themselves and then we'll go into the topics. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sophie. I work for a company called the Zenon Group, um, who are a FM training provider, um, recruiter and consultancy service. I've been in recruitment um, since the back end of the 90s. So I've seen a few changes um, and I've actually specialised in FM recruitment for the last nine years. So I'm really looking forward to sharing some of my experience to help some of you out today. Good afternoon everybody, I'm Wayne Young, I work for the Active Care Group. Um, I've been in FM for nearly 10 years and seven, seven years of that I've been a manager. Um, I've worked in a number of FM industries, banking, education and healthcare most recently. Um, my, my passion in FM is, is young people and talent and innovation around that. Um, my most recent role is with the Active Care Group, I joined in November um, and in that I am currently undergoing a whole centralisation strategy which is including recruiting quite a few people at the moment which is challenging. So I'm going to be talking about that today. Good afternoon everybody, I'm Rupa Datta, founder of Portfolio People. I also started my career in recruitment in the early noughties. Uh, and I've seen lots of changes in, in the workforce sector. I've also spent some time in business development in mobile workforce solutions uh, and customer success. I'm here today to talk about the power of portfolio careers, give you an insight into that. I'm a walking, talking portfolio person myself, and I'll explain a little bit about how having a portfolio career has worked for me. Great, so I'm up first um, and I'm going to talk to you about the recruiter's perspective. So obviously the whole process of applying for jobs, um, you may not go through a recruiter, um, you may hit an internal recruitment function or you may go through directly to HR or a hiring manager. Um, my perspective as a recruiter, I feel that's quite valuable for you to know about um, to help you to put together the right information to get, get your message heard really and get that opportunity. Um, so to really try and see through the eyes of the recruitment team. So we need to find out very quickly if you are the person that we're looking for. When you apply for the, um, the job that you've probably seen online, it's very quick to click um, and upload your CV. Think about it from our perspective. We need to identify very, very quickly whether you've got what we're looking for. And we need to identify that probably in the first half a page of your CV, in all honesty. At the moment with COVID, the level of applications coming through for each job is phenomenal. Um, so it, it's even more important that you stand out from the crowd and do that something different. Um, so what I would say is to um, be specific as much as possible and think about the role that you're applying for. So looking at your CV, I want to see your name really big because I need it to stay in my head that that's who you are. I need to know how I can contact you. So your email address, your phone number, that's all I need. I don't need your address. I don't need how many children you've got if you've got a driving license, okay? Next, I wanna see you profiled in a nutshell. And what I mean by that is maybe one or two sentences about you. So what, what you bring to the party, really short and to the point. And what I would suggest is that the information that you give me there is related to the specific job that you're applying for. Basically, you want to make sure you sound the perfect candidate for that role, okay? Underneath that profile section, what is really useful for me to see 
is what you have done. So some evidence of what you have achieved. So perhaps you might call that a key achievement section, uh, a proudest career moment section, call it what you like, but in that section, showcase yourself, okay? So if you've saved a million pounds by changing a process, tell me about it, okay? Um, if you have um, you know, implemented a, a whole change within your team that has resulted in something positive, tell me about it, because that is all the kind of things that a new employer may want you to do for them. So you really use that section to showcase yourself. Don't go crazy, I'd probably say four or five points is all you need um, just to get that across. And again, keep it flexible for each role that you're applying for. I can't stress enough how one size does not fit all. Your CV needs to be flexible. So you've done that section and you're specific about it, which is great. When you start talking about your current employer or your last employer, good thing to think about then is you may know all about your company and what that company does. It's unlikely that I know all about that company and what they do. So give me some context and give me a one liner. I work for such and such and they do this one line because instantly I think oh right okay so when I start reading about your role and your accountabilities I know how you fit in to that business so that's a really good tip as well give context to your reader another thing to bear in mind I would say is to mirror my language so when I what I mean with that is when you've read a job advert or you've just speculatively applied perhaps and you've looked at the company website there's language that they use you'll you'll recognize certain words and certain keywords talk to me in my language okay mirror my language throughout your CV because again that will be very helpful to you um, Another thing that I would say on your CV, you've listed all your career history and that's great, but consider a about me section. Okay, so it's the classic thing of CVs gone past, hobbies and interests. Okay, now some people may completely disagree with this, but actually I feel that the positives for putting in an about me section is it starts to give more context to the reader as to what your motivators are and what your drivers are. And actually, perhaps you're somebody who is in a sales role and you know in your private life, you're quite competitive. You like to run marathons or you play team sports. That can show a bit about your personality that may actually be a good fit within the roles that you're applying for. And also what it can do is um, give the reader uh, some ways of easily building rapport with you. So when you get to interview stage, they look at your CV and they've instantly got these things where they can start talking to you to break down those barriers um, and to make things more comfortable. And you've probably got something in common, whether you support the same football team or you do the same things at the weekend. But it's a really good thing to think about introducing into your CV. Overall, I would say with your job search process, be selective, okay? I hear all the time about people who are applying for roles and they hear nothing and the dejection in their voices when I speak to them. Realistically, there's a lot of people on the market at the moment, okay? And if you do these simple things to make yourself stand out, brilliant, okay? But don't apply for things that, yeah, you've maybe got 30% of the skills for. Um, and the experience for. Be selective because all you're going to feel is disheartened when you don't get a response, okay? Uh, so definitely keep that in mind. And probably my, my last real point here is to follow up. It's very easy these days to send your CV in for a job and you literally click a button on the screen, off it goes, and then you sit and wait. And again, I hear people saying, well, I don't hear anything. I never hear anything. But what stops you from actually trying to follow that up? It may mean you have to do a bit of digging around for a phone number or an email address, or you go through LinkedIn, but try and make contact with that, that company. Um, and, and you don't need to do that straight away. Give it two or three days, four or five days, but try and follow it up because you might just jump the queue. You might just get on the phone to the right person. And actually, when you've got your voice to back you up as well and you can ha start having a conversation, you're human. And we love humans. We love people. So follow up. I can't accentuate any more than that. Try and follow up. It will help you most definitely. 
And just to finish up before I hand over to Wayne, the information as a recruiter that I send to a hiring manager with your CV is my motivation for why I've put you forward for a job in the first place. Make sure I know that. Make sure you know your recruiter and they know enough about you to sell you because that's effectively what we're doing. I'm going to hand over to Wayne because he's going to you know, explore that hiring manager and what they're looking for so he can give you a bit more insight into that. Thank you, Sophie. Yeah, so so for, for me, it's, it's just about discussing kind of what, as a hiring manager, we're looking for, what we're, we're exploring. Obviously, as Sophie's touched on, there's a lot of applications out there at the moment, and it's about identifying yourself uh, as that key talent that we're looking for for the future. COVID-19 has, has changed the way in which hiring managers look at that. Uh, obviously, previously, we would have done a face-to-face -face interview and things like that. That just isn't happening anymore. Everything is being done through Zoom, Teams, et cetera, et cetera. So that virtual recruitment is, is, is a realistic thing now. Um, that face-to-face -face me meeting may never happen. I, I joined my business in November and I didn't meet my manager up until the point I'd started the business and a couple of days afterwards in face-to-face. -face. So, so that face-to-face, -face, body language, handshakes, all those things that we once knew were important have changed completely. Um, and you, you can't rely upon that face-to-face -face interaction that you used to have. Reading body language is very difficult uh, for, via a virtual means. You can't tell how engaged somebody is. You can't. It, it's very difficult to see that. <clears throat> so what a hiring manager is looking for in 2021, I've kind of split this down into four different things. Flexibility, communication, technology and ownership. Uh, I'm just going to explore these briefly as we go through this. So hiring managers are looking for flexibility in their people they're looking for people who understand uh, the work-life balance uh, how important that is everybody's under increasing stress and pressure as, as the world goes through what we're going through at the moment and it is important for managers that we we don't overtire our people and and people are able to split that work life especially at home where it's more important to be able to close that door of your office bedroom dining room, whatever that looks like of where you work and, and be able to switch off from work as well as, as being able to do it. But likewise, where, uh, where there's a need and a requirement for a business is being able to, especially in the FM industry, being able to, to work the, the requirement that you need to as well. Um, let's, let's be honest, that happens often um, for many people. Homeschooling is, is a, a new norm for many of us um, and it's about being able to have that professional uh, time, but also being able to, to be able to support your family and things like that. Communication, previously communication, a lot of that was face to face. That everybody probably will be able to recognise their first day in employment and being chaperoned around an office or a workplace, meeting people, uh, getting to know people face to face, those kind of things it doesn't happen anymore. A lot of it is, is about being able to be proactive and, and reach out to the people who you need to speak to um, and being able to to look at that and then hiring managers are looking for people who can uh, be confident in communicating and through, through various means as well so being able to talk via this um, opportunity but also being able to written communication is becoming more and more important the, the use of emails is is on the up as we all know um, and that is, is important as well technology um, who would have thought that Zoom and Teams were going to be as big as they are now? Uh, let, people need to understand how to use it. We, we've all seen the, the video clip of uh, I mean, the BBC interview where the family comes in from the background, that kind of stuff. Um, and it's important during interviews that we, we, uh, we, we all know the new word of 2020 was uh, you're on mute. Um, so, yeah, it's being able to use technology effectively and also looking at what new technology is coming and how we can better our business and our delivery of our business via new technology and innovation. Ownership is probably the biggest one for me when I'm looking for people is, is people who are going to take ownership of their role, ownership of their time, that close management uh, of people and the little nudges that we used to do via uh, being in the area of people and that kind of stuff. It is hard to do now. You, you're not as close to your teams because everybody is remote. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's people being able to own their time, own their, their role and, and how they're going to deliver their role. Um, and yeah, drive forward. So yeah, managers are seeking people who can own their roles, who, who own their own development, development, uh, their day-to-day -day success, uh, and also own their mistakes and what that looks like for the future and being able to deliver and change the way they do things. Um, 
Yeah, so, so hiring managers are looking beyond um, the here and now. They're looking at kind of what the future looks like. Um, and also looking beyond what the, the do is. We're looking at the how and the who. Uh, and that social um, brand is really important as well. So they're not just looking at the, the person who can deliver A, B and C. They're looking at how that happens. Uh, I'm going back to Sophie now to talk a little bit about our personal brand and social profiling. Hi, thanks, Wayne. Yeah, so going back to that, so hopefully that's given a bit of insight into what somebody like myself is looking for when we're looking to identify the right person. Also, what the hiring manager is thinking, so what sits behind all of that. Um, a lot of how we do things these days is via LinkedIn. So that's probably our most important social profile right now. Um, and it can do so much for you as part of a job search process. Don't underestimate that at all because it really can just win opportunities for you, left, right and centre. So what I would say is to um, make sure that you complete your profile. It's it, Many people don't. Um, they will put minimal information on there, but actually give us the information that we want to see, because this is people who could find you, which um, you know you don't even know will be looking for you but if you're giving them information you want to hook them in and get them to get in contact with you so make sure that you've got a nice photograph on there okay obviously you need to think about the suitability of the photograph but a nice smiling engaging face that's all you really need you want to just look like a nice warm human being so definitely have that you've obviously got the option behind your picture you can have an image it's quite nice to do something there and it's quite nice to keep changing that really um, just keep it fresh it's something you can sort of fiddle about with um, so so definitely definitely do that um, your strap line so after your name you've got the opportunity to put anything that you want to say really a lot of people will literally say you know this is my name and this is my job title but you don't have to do that so this could be your kind of your you know, selling line, if you like. Um, so you could put on there that you are passionate about FM, that you love, you love people, you love what you do. You could do that. You could put it about your job. But what my point is here is be creative because your social profile is about you. And, and the clue is in, in the, the name there, if you like. It's social. It's not a CV. We don't want to see a carbon copy of your CV um, on, on the screen. Absolutely not. Um, this is this is about you. So you want to really inject some of your personality into your profile. Um, what I would say is the way that you do that um, is is really up to you. Um, there's many different things that that you can you can try. Um, the photograph is is certainly going to be really helpful to you. But just the way you profile yourself and the information um, that you put across there show that you're human. You know, show what drives you. Put it in there because it it will be really really helpful. In terms of managing your profile, so you've got it all up to date. You've got a fab photo, great strap line brilliant um, engaging profile you then just need to become active really active on LinkedIn okay and what I would say the, probably the easiest way to do that is just build it into your routine so we all wake up in the morning don't we generally our phone will buzz to wake us up we pick up our phone we check our emails check LinkedIn get online then because you're probably doing it with Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever it may be but check LinkedIn start going through your feed and just become more active in that you um, you start connecting with more people you start commenting you start posting yourself and just get some content out there grow your network for anything that you post any any interaction that you put out there you're going to get people liking or commenting so a great way to start developing your network really easily without even thinking about it too much is you can check on your notifications who's looked at your profile who's commented on your post connect with them if you're not already connect with them it's really really easy um, and then you've got the option obviously to message and ask for something you might want some help you might you know you might ask somebody um, for you know any inspiration that they could share with you about landing your next role as an example but use your network network and invest time in in developing it most definitely um, 
what I would say is how you go about putting posts out there. So video is obviously a big deal. We're all on Zoom and stuff constantly at the moment anyway. Um, video is really, really useful and it does tend to grab people's attention. OK, yeah, it's a bit cringy. I, I've done them. I don't like doing them. It is a little bit uncomfortable, but actually people do engage because, again, you're human. They can hear you. They can see you. They can see what's going on in the background. And there's some kind of relational thing that happens. Um, so it's a great way to get a message out there. So think about LinkedIn stories. Put a quick story up there. If you're doing it on Instagram, try it on LinkedIn. Why not? You've got nothing to lose. But try videos. Um, it's, it's a really great way to get your message out there. Keep it fresh, professional. You know, absolutely, it's not. It's not Facebook. It's not Instagram. Um, but you know, be human um, and appeal to people in that way. There's all sorts of things you can do. My colleague um, Nikki Martin is great with social media and LinkedIn profiles. I would suggest you look her up. She's probably watching now, um, but she could give you some great tips of how to put together a great profile. So talking of profiles, I'm going to hand over to Rupa because she's got an interesting story as to how social media has helped her. Rupa. Thank you very much, Sophie, and good afternoon again, everybody. Um, in order to demonstrate what Sophie just said, I'm going to use an example as to how I believe I came here today and where my, where my recent opportunities have come from. Where did your last opportunity come from? Where will your next opportunity come from? I've been involved in the IWFM uh, by accident, if you like, for five years or so. I was one of those people that kept going to all of the London networking events, and uh, that's where I met a lady called CJ Green. So CJ, if you're in the audience, hello. Um, I, I was also working for an organization that had corporate membership. And so CJ and I connected, CJ and her business partner, if you like, Lisa, who I know is in the audience today. Hi, Lisa. Um, I was going to be speaking at an event for them last year, just before lockdown hit. That got postponed, but because we connected on LinkedIn and on Twitter, kept the dialogue going. So to Sophie's point about keeping an up-to-date profile, Twitter is actually my platform of choice, so feel free to connect with me there. But being authentic, being yourself, posting every day and getting involved in conversations is really powerful. Now, I don't know if I was first choice, hundredth choice, a thousand choice to be on, on this panel today, but I know Twitter played a part in it. So that's my starting point. Where did your, next, uh, where did your last opportunity come from? And where will your next opportunity come from? On the subject of portfolio careers yourself, where I'm going with this is we are not our jobs and we're not our job titles. And Sophie mentioned that a couple of times when she talked about about me. For me personally, the things that stand out for me uh, in profiles are not the job titles. It's, it, it's maybe your volunteer work or it's something else that really gets the conversation going. With that in mind, in this day and age, it's really, really hard to find somebody that does just one thing. You might have a full time job, but most of us have got other things going on outside of work. And that's where you start to form relationships and really, truly connect with people. And actually, from a, a, a job search process, that might be the difference between getting the job and not. And if I think back to my last corporate role, actually, it was my volunteer work on my CV that connected with me with my then boss, the sales director of that last company, because 20 years ago, he'd also been involved in that organization. For those of you that are not familiar with the concept of a portfolio career, here's a crash course for you. Um, it was coined by a gentleman called Charles Handy, who I believe is one of the greatest thought leaders of the 21st century when it comes to management and leadership. And uh, to my mind, he truly predicted the future of work as we know it today, and is probably still predicting the future of work, what it looks like in 30 or 50 years time. So a lot of people thought talking about portfolio careers now, and you can you can hear it in, in different contexts like side hustles, gig economy, and, and so on and so forth. But there is actually a framework around it. And there's four main principles to having a portfolio career. The first of them is paid work. 
So we all need an income, we all need revenue, and I'd argue that in, in today's world, you probably need multiple revenue streams. The second one is volunteering, and that's the one I'm most passionate about in that that is what gets people's juices flowing. No, gone are the days where volunteering is something you do to fill a gap in your CV. Most people will do volunteering at some point in their career. And I realise myself, I've been, I actually have a, a volunteer career uh, and have done for the last eight years, kind of by accident. Um, studying or lifelong learning, and I don't necessarily mean from the context of um, studying for a certificate or a qualification, but it's about keeping our skills fresh in this day and age and to keep our skills fresh for what the job market looks like in a year's time, five years time, 10 years time. The best example of that is social media, actually. Uh, if you think back, it was only 20 years ago, Facebook didn't exist, LinkedIn didn't exist, Twitter didn't exist, but that's changing rapidly and much more rapidly now. Uh, the final strand would be around homework. That's the one that's most subjective, um, but it does make a massive di difference in terms of what your home setup looks like and how that actually impacts your career. So just to frame it in terms of my world and my portfolio over the last year, uh, to add a bit of context to what I'm talking about. So yes, I, I have a face redundancy, but it didn't bother me in the slightest. I understood why I was being made redundant and it wasn't me necessarily, it was the role. However, I have multiple revenue streams, I've got savings, I've got lots of other projects and, and actually worked out very well for me. Uh, volunteering, so I currently serve on, on the board of uh, an education lifelong learning institution, an international one, so uh, the UK board specifically. And, and my, my drivers and my reasons for that are, A, it keeps my corporate skills fresh. It helps me keep the saw sharp, for want of a better phrase, because I can bring those skills into this role. But it also means that I'm giving my skills and at the same time learning. So as an example, uh, last, last night I was delivering a training session. Uh, this weekend I'm being trained myself. Um, and it's just something that you can take back out to the workplace or to your next role. Um, incidentally, I've got my most recent client from a portfolio people perspective through that organization. So you just don't know where that opportunity is gonna come from, right? Uh, studying and lifelong learning, I'd actually put that in the same bucket. So I'm, I'm getting that opportunity from this organization as well. Uh, but that's not to say that I'm not involved in other programs. Um, and finally, uh, the, my home anecdote for, for the purpose of this session is um, I'm one of those people that when lockdown first hit, uh, started cooking again or refound my love of cooking, uh, Indian food specifically, spending some time with my parents. Um, and I became one of those people that was posting on Twitter all of my foodie pictures. Oh, no, uh, I've even set up an Instagram account. The, the premise of it really is that it got a lot of engagement and I don't mean likes but comments and dialogues back on Twitter uh, for some of the people that are actually uh, here on this call, I know, and some of the people that I'd maybe lost contact with uh, that I know in different contexts, but it, it, it just kept the dialogue going. And uh, a chap that I met uh, through networking, through a property network about eight years ago, who became a good friend, um, also runs a, a sparkling wine publication if you like uh, so he invited me to do some pairing with indian food and sparkling wine that video was a bit of a hit that then turned into a couple of articles that we did together and i now i've now got a regular column uh doing indian food and sparkling wine pairings if you like as a result of it so my message really is if you have a portfolio career and build one, it actually opens the door to other opportunities. You can start to see the connections happening. And really, honestly, your next opportunity is right under your nose. Brilliant. Great to hear from all three of you on your thoughts and um, guidance. Well, I suppose it's no surprise that we have actually had quite a considerable amount of questions coming in. Um, I've got individual questions to share and I've also got questions which relate to uh, everybody. So I'll start with Sophie, please. Um, can I group two questions together to you for uh, a brief response back on this and we'll try and get through as many as we can. What we'll do as well is if there's questions we're getting that we don't get time to cover off online, then um, we'll, we'll ask the panel to uh, come back to you separately on them as well where we can. So first question, Sophie. Um, 
I'm getting no response to my applications was one of the questions, but then the other one was, how soon is it okay to follow up? So what would the answer to that be on your suggestion? Okay, well, I, I would say, yeah, this is a problem that a lot of people are having is the, the no response. I highlighted in um, one of my talk pieces there about the importance of following up. So how long would I give it? Well, I wouldn't be straight on it, certainly. Probably at least 48 hours, maybe slightly longer because just pure volume of applications going through. Um, but yeah, I, I would certainly give 48 hours or thereabouts and then try and get in contact. If it's a recruiter, you will be able to get through to the right person pretty easily actually um, that isn't isn't a problem if it's directly through to a company it might take you a little bit more time um, but so worthwhile doing it definitely okay Wayne uh, could you please offer any advice for video interviewees um, both basic do's and don'ts and any more subtle body language communication uh, we could also open that one up to anybody else that wants to put tips in on that one too yeah so, so from my perspective, uh, yeah, video video interviews are a challenge on both sides. I think as a manager, it's hard to to be on, but likewise as a as an interviewee, and I've been in that situation. I think the the key elements to that are dress as if you dress for any normal interview as you would have done prior. So show that you you're smart, show show kind of you you are um, you dress well and things like that. But also don't forget to add bit of humour if that's your charisma don't forget to add a little bit of yourself in there as well and, and try and not make it so false so they, they want to feel like there's a person on the other end of the video and not just a, a face um, so yeah try and become alive in that video uh, as best you can um, I'm sure the, the other members of the panelists might have some input on this as well maybe yeah okay. Uh, yeah, happy to put in. I support Wayne's uh, Wayne's view there, really, that um, you are going to an interview still. That the only thing that's really changed is is the mechanism. Uh, so do you be you dress appropriately um, and and do the best you can on on camera. Everyone's going through the same situation right now. Leading on from that. Uh, with the with your CV, if you actually put on the bottom there some things about yourself. There you go, there you've got an opportunity to start building rapport. So whether that comes from your interviewer or you start talking, there's some information there that can really help to, you know, just put that mood at, at ease because it's it's a tense time having an interview online, definitely. Question from uh, Sarah, we've got um, various questions about kind of how visible you can be when you're looking for a role. Obviously it's quite a, a tricky time at the moment in terms of, of the whole, uh, pandemic environment but question is I'm looking for an opportunity but on LinkedIn I don't want to say I'm in employ I am in employment however my employer's talent team are actively seeing who is looking so how can I open that up to say that I am looking for an opportunity but without my current employer knowing that's to anybody well, I can certainly chip in on that. So with LinkedIn, you've, you've obviously got the, um, the option there to highlight yourself as being open to opportunities. Um, completely understand why people don't want to do that. It, you know, you do need to manage that back carefully. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly how you go about that. Yeah, do it under the radar. You don't have to select yourself to have the green banner going around your profile that you are looking for work. Um, but the people who get to view that you are open to opportunities is anybody who holds a LinkedIn recruiter license. Um, so anyone with that license like myself, I can see that, you know, you are looking for opportunities. Um, so it's just something to be really careful about, I suppose, and just do it, do it subtly. Thank you. Uh, question for everybody. Um, when it's a job that's advertised on LinkedIn, is it better to apply for the company uh, for the role through the company's website itself or just through the actual application that's listed on LinkedIn? Wayne, you look like you might want to answer that one. Yeah, I was going to say, from a manager perspective, I think it shows engagement if you go via the company. Um, it, it shows that you, you're willing to interact directly with the company, et cetera, et cetera. So from, from my perspective, I'd always look more favourably upon somebody who'd gone via uh, the company website and applied that way. Um, it, it does, to me, shows that they're looking 
in detail at you as a business and and taking interest in you as a business and not just doing the one click potentially thank you okay um i think rupa this would be a good one for you i've i've been in fm for over 15 years but i've been out of work since december and only been able to gain contract work this has been a stumbling block when applying for permanent roles how do i achieve getting a new role when i must when i could be perceived as a risk or flighty so it's a great question actually um it, it would be a shame actually in, in this current climate if people view contractors as a risk or flighty um i, I then actually question the the employer themselves it also depends on on the role um, so some some roles lend themselves to being contract roles, and as long as you can act confidently and competently explain why, then that should be absolutely fine. Similarly, ask the question of the employer as to why they believe that to be the case. Uh, there are some roles that genuinely should be contract roles, and there are some roles that genuinely should be permanent roles, uh, and that's the same for freelance. And it's it's just about changing the mindset both for yourself and for prospective employers from my point of view yeah i can i can also chip in on that one and say that actually people who have been going from one sort of contract or temporary position to another to another you can get caught in that trap but i would say you know a, a positive coming out of that is if you've got the opportunity to add some kind of covering letter with a cv if you're applying for something permanent address it be you know straightforward about it and and bring it to the fore that actually at that point in your life that suited you and what it, what have you gained from that experience you have worked with many employers and gained lots of different experiences by working as a an interim or a temporary worker and that's actually really positive because in a lot of ways it will have fast tracked your your skills and experience you know within your career anyway so i think you can really turn it into a positive um but i think that starts with you and your mindset about it okay staying with you sophie um question on uh cv length uh quite a few people are wanting to just understand what you think would be the best length of a cv <laughs> okay so I, I would say there is no ideal length it is about content okay we if you think about it with the hiring manager and the recruiter in your mind okay right now we need to identify quickly we need the information that we we need to see as a match of a person or not but we need it quickly so we don't want war and peace be concise be specific and if it doesn't need to be on there don't put it on there okay i think with a with a, any kind of role actually in any sector a certain amount of it is um is assumed that you do certain things so you don't have to list down every single accountability that you have within your role because it is assumed well of course you do that of course as a facilities manager you you manage and oversee health and safety of course you do all right but what i would suggest is the information that you do put on there is relevant to the role that you're applying for okay and if you've read through that job description or or the advert you're gonna know and you'll have identified yourself what the key points are um that you know that employer is looking for and if you think about why they're looking in the first place for somebody it's because they have a problem that could be that somebody's left their workload has increased but they have a problem and they're looking for someone to solve their problem be that problem solver solve that pain by giving them exactly what they need that's how much of a cv you need that could be two pages that could be one page that could be four pages don't get hung up on how many pages Thank yeah, and, and to kind of mirror what Sophie's saying there, it, it is about context. It's about being able to see that information and, and quite quickly. If you're looking at a lot of CVs, it's important to see that information quickly. It's about seeing the detail you want to, and to pick on kind of what Sophie said earlier. It's about mirroring as well. So if you see stuff, make sure you've got it in there. It's, it's about feeling that there's a gel um, and it's going to be a comfortable relationship going forwards as well. Thanks, Wayne. Just staying with you, Ron's got a question that just draws upon what you were saying earlier. Um, he was asking, what do you mean by owning your role when you mention that? Absolutely, yeah. So so for me, it's, it's about um, seeing people who can, can take their role, deliver their, what their, their expectations are, but also look for what the, that future element of that role is going to be, how they can develop it, how they can 
change it to, to deliver within the business because businesses are moving as fast as, as everybody else is at the moment in, in developing into a new world. Um, and it's about how you as an individual can look at your role, develop it, and, and not need as much um, input from a manager um, and, and how that looks like there. Okay. Staying with CVs and the content within them, um, quite a few people are asking, do most employers and, um, and recruiters routinely use keywords and skill search tools? Um, and how vital is it to get the keywords in your CV rather than just being yourself? That's, that's to everybody. So I'm happy to, to go first on that one. Uh, so I think it depends on who the employer is and whether or not they will be using such tools. So if it's a, a really famous company that has has the capacity to, to do so and they you know that they're going to get thousands of applications for one role, then that by default would become some sort of filter for them. Um, but I think it also highlights the need for being visible and being present on social media. So yes, there will be a filtering tool, but that's not to say that you can't get in through the back door um, if, if you are maybe connecting with them, commenting on them, because they will look you up um, or find somebody that works there that you can communicate with and that perhaps can make an introduction. Anybody else on, on that one? Yeah. Um... I think, yeah, certainly those tools are, are are out there and are being used. And the thing is, the person who's putting in that application, you're not going to know if those tools are being used or not. But it's all about speaking the same language. So within FM, there is, you know, there are various kind of keywords that are used um, and you will understand that. So, again, it's about taking the information you're given about the opportunity, looking what words they're using, what language they're using and mirroring and that back in the information that you're putting across because then if um, there is keyword searching being used okay it's going to pick that up it's fine but just generally anyway if you're speaking the right language people are more likely to read and people are inherently lazy I'm not trying to offend anybody there but let's be honest we haven't got all the time in the world um, we need to identify quickly so speak my language and, and I will understand very quickly whether we need to have a conversation and that's what it's all about with your, your CV. Thank you a couple more quick questions on a Teams interview or any other uh, platform interview would you recommend blurring the background or showing the actual background that you're in which do you think would would be working best looks like Rupa might have an answer to that one uh it's, it's actually a hot topic on linkedin at the moment uh to be fair and I, I don't think it's to do with interviews i think it's to do with everything uh my, my personal preference would be a, a background that's that's true to you and, and your own home um but I, I don't i don't think it matters in the grand scheme of things it's as being as real as authentic as you can be uh, people should be looking at you and uh, again content is more powerful than the background um, but yeah I, I guess a personal preference would be having a real background rather than a, a silly one agreed I, I think it's important I think it's important to add here that uh, whichever background you go for I, I don't look at backgrounds in particular but if it's a mess in the background that that says a lot about a person um, and I think that we need to as a we need to ensure that the, the background is suitable and tidy and organized and not just a mess okay and i guess just a round robin for everybody what would be um it's from jason this question what are the big red flags to not have on your public profile things that you've seen where you say to yourself no um what was that on there for you know just general update from everybody on that well one thing that i would say and again this, this might be a little bit controversial i personally don't think you should have your cv on your linkedin profile and my reasons for saying that is um if you think about your linkedin profile as a bit of a hook so you're trying to reel somebody in you're trying to get them to look past your photo and scroll down and and read all about you I think if you give them your CV that they can click and have a look at, 
they may have no reason to get in contact with you. And actually what you want to happen is for them to be intrigued to think, oh, I want to speak to this person. Because by the time they got in contact with you, whether it's a quick message or you've, you've shared your contact info and they can, um, they can reach you by phone, you've got so much else in your arsenal there that you can use to engage with that person. So if you put your CV on there, they've got it all. You've given them everything and they may not be blown away by your profile and your CV. But if you're somebody who can present yourself incredibly well, either on video like this or on the telephone, then that's the way that you want to go. So don't, again, you, you've got to think, does that need to be there? Is that going to help me? I would argue it's not necessarily going to help you. Don't know how anybody else feels about that, but that's my thoughts. <laughs> yeah, but I've certainly got a view on that too. I think everyone's opinions are subjective I, I certainly agree with Sophie about CV shouldn't be linked in uh, they are two separate things and, and two separate reasons um, but as long as you're being yourself think of it like dating right what, what's the worst thing that can happen where uh, you, you're behaving one way on social media uh, and then when you get to a video interview or even the, at, get to the job god forbid you, it's a completely different person um, it's very subjective of course i see things that make me cringe on linkedin but that just may mean that that person is not really my cup of tea also doesn't mean that they can't do the job that they're going for um i'm going to use twitter as an example uh i am i am very much me on twitter the way i speak on twitter is the way i speak in real life um and it's just about having that true authentic voice so that there's there's no discrepancies in the future Thank you very much. Oh, we've got one last question, um, which I think leads quite well into what you've said there um, to everybody. Um, what are your thoughts on stepping up into um, a role in a new company? So in that context, are companies in a position to hire you on a more senior position if you didn't have the title before? Or are they, say, or are they staying on the safe side, only people who did have this title before? to reassure that they're skilled enough. Um, are you seeing that coming through at the moment? Is there any suggestions that you've got on that in the hiring and recruitment world? I would say I wouldn't, I would, certainly wouldn't let anything like that be a barrier for, you know, to you to try and go for a, a higher position. What I would say is um, my experience at the moment is that any businesses that are employing are wanting a lot for their money if you like so you know they know that budgets are tight if they're employing somebody that person needs to be worth their salt um, and they need to get what they need for their money but I, again I wouldn't get too hung up on job titles because actually between companies one you know a job title to one is something completely different to another business and it is more about how you're um, projecting those those skills in your communication so your CV your LinkedIn profile or, or whatever um, and it, it should certainly not not be a barrier I think all those opportunities are out there but they're looking for value for their money right now Thanks very much, Sophie. Um, one question quite a number of you are asking is about um, actual qualifications relating to the um, facilities management industry. And I just direct you to the IWFM's website where we have um, the professional development and the training, and the latest courses for um, anybody that's interested in various different uh, skills and um, levels. So please do go to that. Um, if we just also, look if there's any last questions i think we're, we're done on that it's been a really really informative session and um i just wanted to say thank you very much for joining the panel giving your insight being put on the spot with all these questions which have been really really um i think just so helpful and um just to say um watch this space it looks like there's probably a little bit of uh, <laughs> topics here that we could go with again in the future so um we'll look to do that and just to say thank you very much to everybody that's joined and this this video recording will be available after the webinar to be played back as well so thank you very much to all the panel once again